Well, thank you for having me. Uh, I am very much excited about web accessibility, digital accessibility. I just got back from a conference from Monday to today uh, called Access U, put on by a, a group called Nobility, K-N-O-W, Bility. And uh, so I've got lots of fresh enthusiasm about this topic. Um, let's have a, I want this to be very interactive. We're a, we're a fairly intimate small group. I would love to know from you guys who has experience with web accessibility already or digital ex accessibility. Adrian, Sherry says very little. Um, I'm trying to find my hand. <laughs> there <it is. laughs> Bianca says none. What are, what am I missing? I, I need to get pull up my chat window back up. Um, Jillian has a little. Okay. What do you think, Susan? Should I say medium? I think you should say hi. Hi. Okay. Um. Yeah. Um. Louise and I work together on projects, and digital accessibility is part of Louise's charge. So uh, with the kind of renewed cultural interest in us having uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, one of the really important parts of ex uh, inclusion is making sure that people with uh, disabilities, that in my conference they were using the acronym PWD, people with disabilities. Um, would have the ability to use the experiences that we're making available online. Jillian, I worked on the government website for federal student loans at Accenture. All right. So um, I am a UX person. I am not a coder. So I rely on my developer partners to actually make sure that the code itself is accessible but I champion for digital accessibility. And that's basically what I'm going to do tonight. I'll share some resources if you're interested in more, but um, it's really helpful for everyone in uh, our industry and just people in general to be um, aware of this as an issue. Let's go forward. I want to, I want to make this uh, interactive to a certain degree. Let's first talk about what is the official definition of digital accessibility. So you can read it there, but I'm gonna read it to you. The inclusive practice of removing barriers that prevent interaction with or access to websites, digital tools and technologies by people with disabilities, PWD. So that includes not just websites, but also software and uh, phones and uh, all, all kinds of other tech, just like uh, curb cuts on streets help everybody. Digital accessibility helps everybody too. Can you move forward for me, Sherry? Thank you. So in that definition of people with disabilities, we are encompassing people with vision deficits or complete blindness, but, but often vision deficits, hearing deficits, mobility impairments, cognitive issues, speech issues, and then neural issues. Let's play a game. <laughs> uh, can you go to the next slide for me and make sure I'm in the right place? All right, come go back one. I just needed to check. I should probably be driving my own slides, but I just like this. Let's play a game. Um, can you think of, first of all, do, does, do any of you know people that have vision deficits? And feel free to come off mute. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, we've been working with uh, Jose from Lighthouse from the Blind. Okay. At the and city? Then, yeah, and there are several uh, co-workers who have low vision or some sort of um, vision impairment. Right. Uh, have any of you uh, had vision? Or do you wear contacts? Do you wear glasses? Do you wear, you know, do you need correction? Yeah. Yes. And okay. um, 
I actually had my eyelids dilated last week and that was a big vision impairment for uh -huh. a temporary one, but we forget about uh, temporary as well as um, situational type. Okay. Of so this is, this is what I wanted to talk about. All of us have conditions that make it hard for us to see. We might be in a very dim room. We might have a big bright light in our eyes that makes it harder for us to make things out. Our, uh, our phone might suddenly not allow you to, to turn up the brightness or your, or your laptop, or you might be using a terminal uh, or getting gas. I've had this happen to me when I'm getting gas in the sunlight where there's sunlight on the display and glare. Can you guys think of other examples of that type of thing? Situations, Louise mentioned situational or temporary. Temporary would be her example of, I had my eyes dilated when I went to have my eyes checked. Um, I have new contact lenses and they make my eyes water or I'm, my eyes are watering or gummy from uh, allergies, right? And I, yeah, and uh, eye injury, you know, you get hurt and have to wear a patch for a while or. Yeah. So or, those are, th those are things that we don't really think of ourselves usually needing uh, accommodations for disability. Um, there are, what, what's the latest stat, Louise? Do you happen to know of the percentage of the population that requires accessibility? Um, yeah. Um, Accommodations. I know it's getting over 20% now. But. Um, in the U.S., I heard in this conference that it was tw uh, one out of five needs some kind of accessibility accommodation yeah. to use a website. And uh, it, worldwide, it was one out of seven. But I, I, didn't, I didn't do my homework and figure out whether that was exactly right. Let's talk about situational things where you might have trouble hearing or you, uh, you might need. So if we think about the types of, uh, adjust adjustments that we make for, for people with vision, there are screen readers, uh, vision impairments. There are screen readers. You can make the text bigger. Do you ever make the text bigger on your phone or on a website? Uh, usually the browser you can hit command or control and plus to make the text bigger do you ever need to do that all the time <laughs> and, and as we mad, age, but i can't <laughs> yeah as we age a lot of people uh have more trouble uh focusing on near things so they might need to magnification uh so you know but, and sometimes oh sorry susan sometimes i think people sending things and not realizing they're sending them very small or the technology translation between one platform and the other. Um, that, that there are certain things that come in on the Mac and you're like, how tiny is that? My gosh, you know, probably because it came from another platform. So there's mm -hmm. also those technology barriers that end up making us having to adjust as well, I think. So, yeah. So in, in hearing one of the, one of the big, accommodations that we make for people who have hearing deficits is that when we have audio content, we provide uh, closed captions or open captions so that you can use the captions. Do you ever use the captions on your television or on a website or in a, in a meeting? Yes. Even though you're, you're not deaf. Often. <laughs> um, like, for example, I think accents are kind of hard to understand. Even when you watch British shows, like on Netflix, I always have captions on. <laughs> because sometimes they use, uh, their accent makes it hard for you to make out what they said. Yeah, for me. <laughs> and English is my first language, but sometimes I think British people are hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, they can, yeah, they can be very different. So um, yeah, yeah, try, try living amongst them for two years on a ship. <laughs> it's very, it was very interesting, so. Yeah. Um, captions are also helpful if you have a sleeping baby or mm -hmm. you have guests and you don't want to disturb them or you're watching something and there's little kids and it's going to have bad language. 
that kind of stuff. Um, you use transcripts, Adrian, at, for all large meetings at work. Transcripts that display or that you share in advance, how does that work? Um, so typically for, uh, if there's a slide presentation, uh, they try to uh, have uh, enough descriptive text within those slides. Um, but we have like live trans, uh, transcripts happening. Um, and again, that's uh, to accommodate, you know, our coworkers, but again, accents, you know, uh, we have people from a lot of different countries and English might not be their first language or maybe they learned British English. And some of the things I say, they're like, what, can you repeat that? So it's just a little bit helpful in a large um, presentation. You just turned on the captions here. Yep. <laughs> Good job. Um, they're so pretty accurate, there are it's amazing. Captions, right? Mm -hmm. um, I had a descript, uh, I went to a session of a woman who calls them auto captions. <laughs> <laughs> and she gave several funny examples of when the caption, the auto caption gets it wrong. Um, oh, yeah. At Firecat, we, we have a, an event series that where we post YouTube and I was allowing YouTube to just make the captions for me because, you know, it was easier. But recently I learned how bad I went and looked at them and I saw how bad the captions were. So I ended up uh, getting a subscription to a, a service called Otter, like a little mm -hmm. sea animal, Otter, O-T-T-E-R dot A-I. And um, now I import from, we record with Zoom just like these, and then I import them into Otter and it gives me a pretty good quality caption that's auto-generated with AI, but it's not perfect. And then I can go in and edit it and export it with timing so that it resyncs with the video and I can upload that separately to YouTube. Yeah, I, I use that for Zoom. Zoom already has the Otter built in um, if you do it to cloud. Um, if you do it to cloud and then you can go in and make the edits there, but um, it's difficult to get the live transcriptions in a text file it's in a vtt file so uh they want you to use you know the zoom or you can see the the, the conversation um but uh, i use them and the otter seems to be very very nice um and much it's, much it's more better accurate than, than a lot google. of them it's I better than know google that, for sure uh, otter was included with our cloud recordings yes because i'm always recording on my machine i don't trust it to to get there and we run out of space so quickly right but you just get it and then you can go look at it download it um and, and it's all going to be separated once you download it but if you want to see it all together working working with it for a little while uh, right and we have ours like at work it's set up to be every 30 days it's dumped so i have a short window to get in there and do my analysis and do things and then pull it over okay um so, let's talk Go ahead. Oh, I was wondering if you on um, the Aurelius product that said he said they had really good transcriptions. Have you? Um, I haven't tried it yet. Yeah. So I'm just um, curious how that holds up. Right. I think it's going to keep getting better. When it first started, it was, it was terrible. terrible, terrible. And, and it's Google, gotten a lot better. Google is still terrible. I just got a Google tra Google voice transcription yesterday and I'm like, this doesn't even make sense. <laughs> You know, but this is an example that fits right in with the curb cut theme that transcripts were, you know, developed perhaps for the accessibility community or other things. And now they're being used for lots of different purposes besides that original accessibility. You know, they benefit everybody. Right. That's the that's the point of this slide. And, and this part of my presentation is just to to help us understand that when you when you make things accessible you're making it accessible not just for that one in five person who needs a straight up you know i can't i can't participate without captions or i can't participate unless i can blow text up 400 percent it's all of us can benefit from them just in the way that curb cuts benefit anybody with a rolling suitcase or a mm -hmm. stroller you know that kind of thing um, let's talk about mobility impairments, temporary mobility impairments that you might have experienced. Straws were made for the disabled. I didn't know that. 
Yeah, that's what I was told many, many years ago. They did it because they couldn't sit up enough to drink and things like that. So they said they got to figure out a way to get it to them. And then it took off. <laughs> now we're having to make them pipe, you know, paper because they took off too well. So, so we need to thank the space program and this and people with disabilities. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Made a lot. Um, mobility impairments uh, include things like uh, people who are paralyzed and have to use a blow tube to type on a keyboard or use a keyboard to navigate. That's an extreme example of a mobility impaired person, but it can be something as simple as I hurt my wrist playing tennis and now it's hard for me to move my mouse accurately or I have carpal tunnel, mm -hmm. right? It can be that kind of mobility for, for mice or typing or um, just sometimes people have numbness. I think diabetics and older people often have numbness in the extremity. So they might have trouble with tap targets on their phones. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> sometimes when I've uh, been to a happy hour and gotten a little too happy, I might have a little <laughs> mobility impairment on accuracy <laughs> on that kind of stuff. Can you well, guys think of any other examples of that? Well, you know, injury, um, you know, somebody, um, I, I broke my wrist one time, you know, so I had, you know, couldn't use it for uh, six, eight weeks, whatever it was, kind of thing. Yeah. And that really slowed me down. Yeah. Jillian is saying she had a, has a friend who loves to use voice memos instead of typing because typing is difficult. So um, the, the voice to text was invented for people who needed voice to text, but we all use voice to text some, I mean, I do. I use Alexa to tell me the weather as I'm brushing my teeth. Right. Um, and when we're driving, it's so imperative. They tried to pass laws that we couldn't touch our phones. Anybody here cross your heart that you don't touch your phone while you're driving? I'm reducing it. <laughs> USA has a, has a new program where they're tracking you to say you, you can save money on your insurance up to 15% per driver. And really? uh, it's about, yeah, it's about um, not, well, not of course using your phone, but even using it in a, say in a hands-free mode, they note it and said, Hey, you could reduce your, you know, your risk by reducing your hands-free driving. So it's very interesting. My biggest problem is I am in such a hurry all the time. I try to get going before I've got everything all set up. Yeah. I need to just chill out and set up. I'm going to yeah. make a vow that I'm going to do that. That's the hard part. You, you know, and Susan, I'm thinking about mobility too. There are um, uh, both aging and other kind of um, problems where, you know, Parkinson's where you have maybe a, a shake a tremor, or yeah, tremor of some sort, or um, as you age, sometimes maybe, you know, you lose some of that fine motor skill, depending. For sure. Yeah. One of the, one of the big takeaways from the conference about, there was a whole session on access usability testing for accessibility. And one of the big groups that we really need to pay a lot of attention to is 70 to 90. Mm -hmm. age. She said, you, you'll get, <laughs> and if you're trying to recruit for uh, accessibility conditions, you'll get a lot of them. If you just <laughs> skew pretty old, you know, so, and we're giving them a, an honorarium too. So we're <laughs> helping them out financially. Um, cognitive. Oh, look at the puppy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, cognitive stuff. There was, there was a lot of content in this, in this, uh, conference about that, um, a friend of mine came and gave us a talk on plain language. It's maybe something that we don't think about. And you, how many PhDs do we have on this call? Four? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so grade level is one way that we try to try to screen our text and aim our text to, uh, what's your target for the city, Louise? Sixth to eighth grade. I would prefer sixth, but I'll have to probably put up with eighth you know, for more technical writing. And it's going to be rough because people keep adopting from FedGov 
so um, that it's it's going to be a all you know get that done. But we're working on it. Mm -hmm. And plain language. And plain language. And um, what I, I got a, a real interesting education about this at the conference as well. A lady who had a PhD, she was a PhD economist uh, named Ann Forrest, and she was in her car in DC. She worked in DC. She was dr driving past the Lincoln Memorial and got hit, her car got hit and she got spun around and I think rolled. Her, her head went forward, back and side to side during the the series of impacts and she thought she was okay the police came they they brought an ambulance they they said was anybody hurt and she said no because she thought she wasn't um then she she went to the hospital and got checked and they thought she was okay or going to be okay but she was just sort of shocky and they said you can go back to work in a week and she went back to work and she couldn't she couldn't cope with it at all, like the noise and the visuals, and she couldn't read. And she said it was this horrible uh, series of discoveries of things that she used to be able to do and now could not. She had two small children. She had to quit her job. It was, it was quite disruptive, but she became uh, attached to the University of Texas um, program that studies digital accessibility. And she became one of their star pupils. One of the things that she can't tolerate, she can't use a screen more than about an hour a day because it's too exhausting. And the reason she can't is that she had a brain injury that hurt the visual, the connection between her eye taking in information and the visual processing of the information. The stat she told me was that, um, 70% of the brain's energy incited people goes to visual processing, mm -hmm. vision and visual processing. I thought that was a crazy number. Even uh, Louise, you said you thought it was more like 60 or Sherry, did you say that? I did whenever uh, Sabrina and I did that uh, presentation on uh, data visualization. Uh, that's a, I think that's the number that we got. But, but even if it was 65, split oh, the right. difference. That's Absolutely. more than half of the in, the energy that your brain uses. It's just such a demanding uh, thing that she would, she says that she has to plan her day around this one hour and then has to take a nap. And that uh, another thing that, that really uses up her cognitive store of information, anything that moves, you know, we have so many things that are slightly animated or that, you know, fly in that 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 takes a lot of processing power from everybody that's the other thing i want to be sure and emphasize this takes more energy for all of us not just her we just know about it because of her and she does mris and they study her but it's taking more energy for all of us uh highly colored interfaces take more energy to process she showed us how to change our phones to grayscale and if you're ever overstimulated, you can you can try putting your your phone to grayscale and just see it's calming. So and it's it's super fascinating. Yeah, that's a really good contrast. I mean, before before we had a lot of technology, when I was teaching a little bit about accessibility back in '98 '99, um, I would ask people: imagine if you take what you're trying to do, take it to a copy machine, and then run it through a fax machine is there enough contrast to still be able to read it? So that's that's a really interesting thing to be able to turn something to grayscale really quickly. And if you've got enough contrast, then you're going to still be accommodating that mm -hmm. need. But we forget about contrast and um, you know people pick colors that are similar value and there's just not enough contrast to them sometimes. Yeah, my, my favorite one that I see all the time is bright red on black. Because if you're red, green, colorblind, that's really hard. Yeah. And there's a large percentage of the population that has colorblindness. Right. And then red, blue, the same value of red, blue can actually cause, um, it actually causes physical. Yeah, exactly. Chromo, chromo stereopsis. Because your, your body is using, one's using, one color, I think, is processed by rods, one by cones. 
So you have a muscle thing happening within your eye that causes a physical tiredness, oh, wow. um, not just a you know mental tiredness on that one. Yeah. And so would like ADHD or ADD, some of those kind of things, would that be under the cognitive as well? Yes. Yes. I, we had a, we had a, Louise, we, I, Louise and I are involved in some testing of some new screens for San Antonio website. Mm -hmm. And I showed my, the, some of our early release screens to, to no vision, like using JAWS readers or, or uh, what's it called? ScreenFlow, I think it's called. Oh. Um, and then one that had needed low vision and she needed to blow things up to 400%. The bad thing about those is you have to end up scrolling side to side to see everything. It's like you're looking through. That's true. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, years well, ago. Where was I going with that? Oh, we had a we had a lady who has uh, cognitive uh, something like ADD, except it's a lot worse for her. And she she passed all of your all of the tasks with flying colors very quickly. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, and what she what she appreciated was that it was not the 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 layout of the page was not overly complex, and that we we didn't have a lot of pop ups. Pop-ups can, and this happens to me all the time. I have ADD and I'll get something popping up and I'll go off and do that thing and forget about this. I leave, uh, I leave drafts in a draft folder in a draft state and don't forget, don't remember to come back and finish the email and push send. That kind of stuff happens to me all the time. I guess I'm neurodiverse <laughs> and proud. Um, speech, speech doesn't really, uh, it is interesting. Louise and I were talking about this earlier today. Um, we don't think of people using voice as an interface all that much, although Google and Alexa have kind of risen and Siri, right. Have raised the bar on that. But, um, People who have a lot of people have speech problems where they ha have a cognitive problem that makes their speech very slow. They have a hard time finding words and they can't use Alexa as effectively or Siri. It will think they're done, right? And neural. I don't know much about neural. We have a neuro, neuro somebody with a neuro PhD on this call. That was me. <laughs> um, what I what I was doing some research about it and talk and thinking about people who have a like are dealing with pain. Yeah, can fall into this where <laughs> things can give you headaches, or if you have a headache, you can't you can't tolerate very much time. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes sense. Um, I also think like with pain, in addition to like. So it's divided into the central nervous system. So like where our brain is and then peripheral nervous system, which is everything else. So like nerves in our hands and fingers and toes and things like that. Um, I think another aspect to pain is also when somebody can't feel, but that's like, uh, or like they have issues, maybe touching the, uh, the keyboard on the computer and because maybe they can't quite feel the tactile senses due to pain mm -hmm. or peripheral neuropathy they might have. Hey. Um, yeah. Have you heard the term haptics? I haven't. What is that? If, when you're, when you're, uh, when your uh, interface gives you a, a touch feedback. Oh, that's it's called the, haptics. The oh. Apple watch too. When your watch like buzzes your yeah, wrist. It vibrates. Oh, you know, yeah. The vibration or the dunk feeling, you know, yeah. Or uh, some video games to give you that in the. Oh, right. When you're like driving a car or something. Right, or... right. And it's <laughs> moving and you feel this, this yeah. uh, resistance and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sherry, why don't you move us on? I'm, I'm okay. diving too deep. I'm having too good a time here. <laughs> um, I want to point out that there are laws that websites, especially those. Uh, paid for with government dollars are required to comply with laws. 
including the American with Dis Americans with Disabilities Act. Did you go somewhere else on purpose, dear? I did. I, I clicked a, a window to open it up, but I'm sorry, it should. Be oh, it's there. okay. You can if you want to. Oh. No. You're still on okay. it. Okay. Um, the, the the particular part of the American with Disabilities Act that pertains to accessibility is called Section 508. So you may hear people referring to Section 508. It's kind of an outdated term now. Uh, what, what you'll hear most of the time is WCAG, and I forget what it stands for, but and people call it WCAG, even though that's an ugly thing to say in your mouth. And right now we're at, we're at double a standards i believe and there's a 2.1 spec that has been published so there are very detailed uh, guidelines and checklists for how to achieve compliance with this law but it's still an inexact science there are um thank you <laughs> um it's and uh WCAG is is released by the w3c organization um let's move on forward there there are large companies have uh been uh what do i want to say sued sued <laughs> yes sued uh that's, that, that's what i know that, uh, lots of government you know there's a judgment and you have to comply you know kind of thing so right so sherry i'm going to post a youtube for this in the chat so that you okay. can play it for us. Okay. Um, what I want to show you is this uh, software. It is, <coughs> uh, it's called JAWS, and it is uh, a screen reader that reads the contents of a, of a web page or an app out loud to someone who can't see. And it's super interesting to see, so I wanted to this is monday.com crm a crm you'll actually want to use can you hear it capture and collect all your leads in one place Manage is this the wrong one the entire sales cycle. it may so have a no this is an ad all right so here we are at is this it yes cake factory just said welcome to the cheesecake factory let me can you hear it my screen reader. yep so maybe turn it up if you can and back make back it back. full screen all right that should be better welcome to the cheesecake factory Welcome to the Cheesecake Factory. So we've got a list of five items. We've got a link. With... No, I don't hear it. Me neither. Oh. All right, well, this demo is a bust. At least we can read it. That's right. <laughs> it's actually reading this, all the elements of the page to him. And it has to describe things. If it's a link, it has to say it's a link. If it's a button, it has to say it's a button. Mm. It, will, it will say if it's a visited link versus an unvisited link. So HTML has all that information built into it and JAWS parses that. So I'm gonna, uh, let's see, share sound. There we go. Okay. Kind of doing something a little bit unexpected. Um, as I just up and down arrow key uh, through that text. List of five items. And then, uh, oh, and now it totally threw me out of my location. I just lost my spot. Uh, but as I was arrowing, arrowing up and down on that text, I could tell that that text was changing, but I wasn't really being told that that text was uh, animating. So that's a pretty big problem for screen reader users. Uh, anytime you have a carousel on your uh, web page, you need to uh, pay special attention to it to make sure that it's accessible. And it, that doesn't appear to have been done in this case. Nope. Um, and so that's that can be pretty confusing where you have content that sort of animates and updates on the fly without notifying screen reader users. 
Um, the Cheesecake Factory heading left, heading left, heading left, land. Link visit for Yandavid.com. Link salted caramel cheesecake. List of five items. Link. Facebook. Link. Twitter. And we got Facebook, Twitter, link. so we've got their Pinterest. social media icons. Link. It's link. Newsletter. List end. List of five items. Link contact US vertical and bar. We have another list. Link investors vertical bar. So, um, the, stru uh, the page is pretty well structured. Um, you know, they have their lists of things and those are in lists. Um, so that's good. Uh, one thing to note is that screen readers really, when I look at a page with a screen reader, it's, it's a very one dimensional view. So I start at the beginning of the document and I go down and through and to the end. And there's not really a concept of something being beside something else. If uh, you have some text and there's an image next to it, that's not really something you can communicate to a screen reader user. Um, it's it's a very when a screen reader sees a web page, it's a very linear view. You start at the beginning and you go through to the end. Um, there's really only a concept of something being before something else and something being after. And sure, so, you can stop, you can stop it. That is let's, okay. let's go back. Yeah, we get the idea. Is it, have any of you? Is this the first time any of you have seen or or heard a Jaws session? Yes. No. But, so you're saying it's the first time, or you have seen them before, Jillian? This is the first that I mean. I mean, I've had. I've. I know of the auto readers, like the terrible um, contrast <laughs> to the actual person reading. I knew of that, but I've not heard of Jaws or where it actually is a human being describing it in a way that's tolerable to listen to. That's very cool. Yeah, um, Adrian has used Jaws for design reviews. Yay! Um, it the first time I saw it, it was just shocking because the people who use these readers they're so used to how this works they and um they they speed it up you know have you ever listened to a podcast and you can make it be at you know 1.25 or 1.5 x or 2x and you can make them talk twice as fast or you can slow them down same thing with jaws you can adjust the reader uh rate um but what he was saying is is the part i want you to take away People who um, use a, a screen reader rely on the keyboard in order to navigate. And there is a large proportion of the, of the disabled community that navigate with keyboards. People who uh, don't have any use of their arms, but they still have use of their legs, can use a, a foot uh, joystick to find things on a keyboard display and they move the jo joystick with their foot to, to, to type things out. Stephen Hawking is an example that most people remember that he used a, a blow tube and, or he had an, a set of, I think something affixed to his glasses that was like a, a laser pointer that he could type with that. So uh, the fact of having to use the keyboard in order to navigate through a website, web page means that the hierarchy it's really hard for us who have been used to being able to see visual hierarchy and visual designers are usually the designers of web pages. And they're used to using things like position on the page and size and proximity to communicate relationships between items. So give the gift of cheesecake, buy a gift card right underneath it. We who are sighted know that those things are are related, but if they, if they were out of order, somebody who's using a screen reader might not might not understand that context. So a lot of um, accessibility work is right now it, we spend w optimizing for Jaws readers and optimizing for keyboard only. And again. When you optimize for keyboard, you're optimizing for people like expert users. In a, if you've ever used a, a very complex backend system in a job that you had, I used to work at the IRS, and we had, you know, we entered in people's tax returns with all the millions of different fields. And if you use the same 
online form over and over and over again, you get to where you know how to tab, 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 95, tab, you know, return. And you're just, you know how to get through that thing like crazy. Muscle, muscle memory, yeah. Right. Um, the, the blind people learn how to do that with websites. And, but it's, there's so many ways for this to go wrong. If you'll go to the next slide, we'll, we'll talk about a few things that we can do to make sure that, that websites are accessible. Go ahead and, and pass past that. We already did this one. Um, so where to start? Uh, when you go to a new web, web page, a, a web page of any kind, there's usually a page title. And if, if, you're, if you ever looked into doing coding with HTML, or if you have mastered styles in Word, there's heading one, heading two, heading three, heading four, heading five, et cetera, right? And it, you can, it's almost like using an outline. You people who have done PhDs, I bet you know how to use an outline. <laughs> um, it, heading one is the title of the page, and then heading two is the first level of subheading, and then there are sub, sub levels underneath that when you use a JAWS reader or a keyboard navigator, like a foot mouse or one of those, you know, eye tracking devices, they often navigate the page based on the headings that you have in there. So that assumes a couple of things. It assumes that it's mostly textual and that you're using headings and that you're using them in the proper order. So if you don't use them in the proper order, it screws that up. The other thing that we need to do for people who aren't sighted is to describe we're, we're showing things to them visually that they can't see. So that's content. And in order to make it accessible, according to the government's law, we have to tell them what the content of the image is, if it matters to the experience. So there are often images that don't really matter, that they're purely decorative or they're only there to create space. We don't have to, to add an, a description to those, but if you look at uh, the, let me see, I can show you one. Here's a picture of my family when I was a little girl in front of a Christmas tree. I'm the baby my dad's holding. And that, that's my brother, Tim, who was very dismayed that I had been born. <laughs> and he has some kind of spaceship toy beside him and a, wide Christmas tree with tinsel and my uh, lovely mother there behind making a face. So if, if I was showing this to a blind person, I would give that level of detail. I, I, or I could just say family from the fifties at Christmas. And there's a whole art form of deciding how much description to add. But the, what the blind people at the conference told me is add as much detail as you can bear to give me because you're you're hurting my experience when you don't and you let give me a lot of information they use the example of a um there was a girl scout um tour visual like a visual tour and the, it was silent in the video and it just went to all kinds of interesting things and we were talking about how to do the audio, how to do the captions for that video. And there was an argument about, well, you don't really need to hear there was a bug on the plant or, you know, lichens on the trees. And they said, I, I will be the judge of what is important. I can sift through the information if you give it to me and I can decide what's important to me. Maybe I'm, I'm into bugs. Don't, don't withhold that information from me. So the, the, the one of the takeaways I had after this week is there's not agreement into what perfect accessibility is. And sometimes these needs are in conflict with each other. So if I give very rich content on a page to a blind person, the cognitive overload person might not like it, right? The super high contrast for low vision people is very helpful for some, and some people find it overwhelming and tiring. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and I and I think that's why when you follow the WCAG guidelines, you um, we we had a controversy recently where someone suggested we use an accessibility widget on the website, and we're already moving toward 
BACAG 2.1 AA compliance. And um, with the new product that Susan's mentioned, you know, we're up there, it's, it's testing out machine-wise at a 99 out of 100 score. So we're really excited about that. But they wanted to throw the widget on and the widget is one, it's not what they're used to. Two, it's adding an artificial layer to things to adjust. It only meets 20% of the guidelines at the most. And um, so now they have to learn something different. They have to learn a different placement. They would, um, and, and it could actually cause problems with the screen too. So if you, you know, pick a standard 508 WACAG, they're actually the same. 508 is using the WACAG standard default at the moment. Um, so uh, then, then you're going to enable these assistive technologies that people are used to, to get the thing done, to be able to adjust it to their contrast, to their size, to their, what they need, um, you know, and, and it, it stayed of course. <laughs> that, that's, um, and Susan, when you're talking about um, these, these descriptions, one of the tips we give folks as they're trying to you know, navigate this alt text is what's the intent of the photo? Why is the image, the graphic, the photo added to the page? All, you think about that because if it's if you just describe the contents of the photo, you might miss the intent. It's there. If you put a chart on to help with the, the text, you say chart. Well, that's not, you know, like you said, be more detailed, but why did you put this chart on the page? What does the chart show that mm -hmm. is helpful to the, the user? Or why is this photo there? Yeah, so. Are we out of time? Sherry, are you on mute? I am, sorry. Um, so I was just gonna show on the volunteers one, you know, this is a, a page that we did for our website and this is not necessarily you know it's just decorative it's not necessarily part of the content so i don't know that the screen reader we would need to put an alt text on this one is that what you're saying well, what, what, or would, would you would like to have a heart we are we are meaning it, it is content with meaning so mm -hmm. what we want to tag is meaningful content so you would say it's a hand-drawn uh heart with flames coming out of it and a starburst that that okay. i mean th one of the reasons we have that on there is it's kind of delightful and okay. it's sort of uh has a hispanic flavor which is appropriate for san antonio right um, there, i mean Adrian can tell you why she thinks this kind of stuff works <laughs> on our on our brand you know yeah and, and when we don't describe it to the non-sighted we're leaving them out Gotcha. Okay. And, and even if it is decorative, you want to mark it as decorative. There is a tag for that. Okay. Because then, uh, like with these machine, you know, we're we're using Site Improve, and by the way, they have a free Chrome extension to check your accessibility. That's really mm -hmm. helpful because it not only checks it, but it tells you what's wrong and how to correct it. Sometimes, right. most of the time. But um, so that you're so you get a complete picture. You don't want to leave an image untagged. You need to say, do the description or say it's decorative. And then the um, the person using JAWS can just, it says it's decorative and they go on by, go, okay, fine. I don't know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks for How, how are that. we doing for time, Sherry? Well, it's 7.30, so, and there's just a few of us, so it's not going to take much time to do the wheel of names. Okay. Um, so one other thing I wanted to mention, it's very, very common. I see it all the time that there would be a page of uh, items, each of which has a buy button. And it, unless you code carefully, the screen readers, they go, they hop to links and it would say buy, 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 buy. But the, the, again, we're relying on proximity often unless we're careful in our coding. So it's easy to make missteps, but the good news is it's pretty easy to fix. So you can so change what those I would, to add to cart and then the learn well, more, learn more, and learn more. Right, there, that's a super common one. And you can make little containers 
that the screen reader will tell the person about. Like here's the t the the you know sailboat t-shirt. You're in that thing, and then you get a buy link. It's it's possible to code around it and have that repetitive, but it's you have to you have to really know what you're doing. And um, Susan, I don't know if they mentioned this one. What we were doing for a while, and I'd have to I'm I'm not coding anymore, so I can't. But what we we're doing for a while when we had some of those read mores and you know whatever the, the kind of repetitive language is absolutely would make the alt text different. So instead of the alt, you know, the visual text would say read more because it was in a proximity, but the alt text underneath would say read more about turkeys, you know, right? Read more about you know tulips, whatever it might be. Yeah. So right. there, there are some sense. funny tricks. Yeah. And click here for me is a usability problem as much mm. as it is an accessibility problem. Don't say click here. Use make the link be the thing that is the unique description. Right. It's yeah. also no SEO. Reason not SEO. To do that. It's also good for SEO if you put this, uh, what you're what are you clicking to see in that. Yeah. So some other things you can do is just when we're creating a design techniques of using personas and scenarios, include a persona or two that require some kind of assistive devices <laughs> or accommodation. Just think about them when we're designing and include them in user testing. Again, one of the good tricks is to include people who are way to the uh, elder spectrum and you'll, you'll likely get a few of these. And then there are lots of accessibility, uh, accessible templates and tools that we can adopt. Yep. I, I feel like that's a good stopping point if yeah. we want to yeah. stop. Susan, one of my say. favorite uh, new mantras is um, from the accessibility community is nothing for me without me. So yeah, don't leave them out. Valuable you know, insight, great people, and um, you're, you're just going to get a lot further when you when you include them and work with them. Yeah. So here's a few more some resources that I like. Um, contrast checker in the designs. There's uh, what CAG has uh, a ton of information, but it's not very consumable. I'm sure it's accessible, but it's but it's uh, sort it's of overwhelming. overwhelming. So I like that. A, A11Y checklist. And, and it's the A11Y is, is a, a play on the words accessibility, right? Yeah. It's, uh, accessibility is an 11 character word and it looks like ally. And we want people to be allies. So that's, that's behind that's that. A, that's a shortcut way of saying accessibility. Yeah, so A11Y. And I find, yeah, people often, when you say accessibility, at least um, a couple years ago around COSA, um, they would think usability. I get userability, usability, and accessibility all meant the same to everybody. So nope. when you write A11Y, it kind of breaks, you know, makes them think, oh, oh, yeah, right. Although you right. have to socialize that term too, but it, it works. And I do want to give a, a tip to, to those who are maybe new to the, the website thing. It seems like there's so many things you have to look for. There's the, you know, the, the design, you have to look for the colors, the consistencies of the UX, the accessibility and all those kind of things. But take those in, um, I would just suggest that you take that in uh, waves. So like go through the process as for usability and find all the issues. Then go through for accessibility issues only. That's all you're looking for. So go through it and comb through it so many times that you're going to know it's accessible, it's usable, it's it's been tested, it's you know it's got research research backup, it's got all of those things that you need um, all the way through. But it that means you have to do it five, six, seven times sometimes. So don't be afraid. That's part of the process. Um, and it seems like it's a lot, but that's a, an easier way to break down what to look for because you're not going to catch them all on the same the first pass. So take several passes um, through that and not let that overwhelm you. 
Susan, is there a um, recommendation for font size? Um, I mean, I know it, the size itself can vary and stuff, but that's one thing my team's been struggling with is to, we, my team does data visualization. <laughs> so we've been on the adventure of trying to make our data visualizations accessible. And so you can imagine when you get to things like vision impairments, that's a, it's been extremely challenging. Um, oh, sure. So data visualization, you, you're trying to pack in tons of detail into the visualizations themselves and the text can get very small. You get like on Y and X axes and that sort of thing. And then and we, you know, we try to keep it at 12, but sometimes we <laughs> go down. And, and so that's been challenging and the boldness and trying to, you know, and, and then just translating like raw, huge amounts of like data findings into a document that's like enough to type out for somebody to read. But um, one thing we, 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 we've been struggling with is the font size. And I don't know if there's like best practices as to how to approach that specific issue. Well, the, the, the main one is don't dictate the font size in, in normal text. The infographics are a whole big can of worms as Louise can tell you. Mm -hmm. So in, in Louise, in the city of San Antonio, we have a lot of um, GIS maps. And how do you how do you explain a map to someone who can't see? What you need to do is is create them a different way of getting information. Map is a great tool for sighted people, and it's okay to cater to a, an audience that can consume visuals. It's okay. And I, arriving at a good size, I, my advice to you would be to test with people and try to keep it as big as possible, <laughs> and and support. Uh, like it, give them a very high uh, resolution version that people who need to be able to blow it way up can look at. And then they would just have to look at it like this. And so, gotcha. and what well, we've been trying, and actually I just got tagged by the CTO the other day to start digging a little more into this, but not right now, but think, you know, keep it on the back burner is how we put it. Um, is about with uh, maps, data visualization, all that. In the past, what we what what I ask the GIS team to do is to always make the data accessible. So a map is created from data, and that data is usually, a, you know, it has to be available to draw the map, right? So mm -hmm. I ask them to put that data into an Excel spreadsheet or some sort of spreadsheet, some sort of access. That, table uh, or whatever, a, right? A table, exactly. That um, the user with a disability could download and then at least they can get to the data. It may not be in the friendliest format. Of course, those visualizations help a lot to understand, um, but at least then the data is available. And if they need, and someone said, well, what good is that to them? Well, if you have 20 addresses, 100 addresses on a map, and they need to get to one of those locations, they can go through the map and go, oh, that one, yes, I can take an Uber to that one. I can, that's the nearest one to my house. They need to get, get to things too sometimes. So the data can be helpful for that. Um, I just tossed a link into the chat. Um, it's a Google URL because I was using Google. So sorry about that. I should have gone directly to the thing. Um, science of the Mind, the local Science of the Mind group had a, lecture on why a picture or a graph is worth a thousand words and i caught the beginning and the end and i'm going to go back and watch this thing but it's talking about data visualizations basically um whether it's a map graph or whatever and what the guy is finding it, it just lined up perfectly with usability we don't want to overwhelm people on a home page we don't want to overwhelm people on a graph and we tend to do way too much of that overwhelming um type of things there's also some innate data skills. It's a very interesting lecture. I'm not gonna try to, I need to go rewatch it because I just got interrupted at the most critical part of it. Um, but it was, it really started out great and ended great. So I'd recommend catching that if you can. Um, also, if you're just getting started in accessibility, I threw in an infographic. It's gonna look a little untidy because um, it's four infographics in one file. It's meant to be printed. We were going to do a campaign where we printed this and put it around um, different offices at the city and COVID happened. So that interrupted us. 
but um, the idea behind it is to start with your top 10 things to do. And Susan covered some of them tonight, you know, like the, um, the text and that type of thing. So it, it gives you some reasoning. Um, I'd have to check my numbers on this again because it's a couple years old now. Um, but it might help you with um, what you're trying to do. And it was done by the city. I don't think we put a copyright on it. We shouldn't have. And if, if we did, I'll go back and put a, uh, a Creative Commons, you know, public use or something like that. So are you offering a resource? Yes, ma'am. Okay. In the chat. And, and we'll send it in the email as well for the follow-up. Awesome. Oh, thank you. Uh, that, that's very helpful, uh, Louise. I'll, I'll definitely look into those resources. I, I know with uh, with my team, uh, what you're describing there, like with ArcGIS, you know, that, that software is like built for data and we use Tableau and we've been mm -hmm. struggling. It's it, And there's just, I mean, they're always working on it, I think, you know, the Tableau mm -hmm. developers, but they it's, it's not accessible at all. They don't no. build it for accessibility. So we do what we can to try and and our solutions have been like what you're saying, like um, you'll have like a map of all 254 Texas counties, like um, who have like the most hospitalizations and you'll, you'll list like the top 10 and the bottom 10, you know, and have that data readily accessible to mm -hmm. if, if people want to download the entire 254 counties as well. Um, so that will be like your accessibility document. And then just like little things that you don't always think of in a design standpoint, like having a image file the, you, there we my team had this tendency of <laughs> making graphics that were just like a jpeg image embedded in a screen and we were, were realizing you the screen readers can't pick up on the text that's in the jpeg image so we, we had to just little things like that that you just realize like oh my gosh like you know this we have to try to get at least like in a, you, you know in a, you embed an adobe PDF or whatever that a screen reader can pick up off right. that, but you have to be careful about those things. So mm -hmm. it's even just building that into the process of making sure we never do specific things. Um, yeah. And just building it into the process of our team, you know? <laughs> right. Right. And that, um, you know, when you talk about embedded text and image, we were just talking about this with our, we, so we've got done away with carousels on the new city site. Yay. <laughs> You know, it's a single, there There can be a single um, hero or single promotional image um, in some cases or, or some individual promotional images um, down in the body text. We're going to a task base, you know, um, what, what are users coming here to do and get done? Um, you know, the plain language. But when you talk about images with text in it, we're actually contemplating how to handle that because it also affects our um, machine translation, or in this case, this product has a dual, what's called a language pack. So we can do any amount of machine translation we want with any amount of languages, but we it also you can also install a, a language pack, which we did for Spanish. And so we can do manual translation and the, the platform will say, oh, there's a manual translation, I'll use this. Um, if there's not, it will use machine. So you get the, the best of both worlds. But if you've got an image with that text in there, that can't be translated. It can't be read by screeners. So not only you, you're, you're being inclusive, um, exclusive, actually, not inclusive, you're um, being exclusive in a couple of different ways, not just one way. Because um, a lot of times we get pushback on accessibility. Oh, that's just a smaller population way. But now that inclusivity and diversity and you know that those have really caught on and um, our focus, I should say, not caught on, but there's a focus on them um, and serving that underserved population. So it's just one more reason to make these things accessible. And when I say accessible in this case, I do mean language access as well, um, or limited English proficiency access, you know, that type of thing, so. Thank you so much for that. Um, do you have any any other questions? I, I have an idea we could talk all night. So, <laughs> um, but we I, I do want to con continue the discussion. All of you should be on our Slack channel. We can discuss things there, if, even if we needed to make a 
a channel for accessibility issues, questions, that sort of thing. Um, why don't we try to do that? Um, uh, do you think that would be good? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Finding oh. time to go to Slack is sometimes oh, a I challenge, see. but yeah. 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 Well, it's just like somebody reaching out and, um, and, and saying, I've got an issue, you know, Sabrina could reach out and, and ask that question. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to give a space for that. Um, so we can go ahead and uh, add that. Um, but uh, let me. Um, and Sherry, I was, I was just going to ask Susan if um, that um, experience design um, sheet we did, Susan, of, of shortcuts and, and uh, I'm losing my words. Um, resource the resource, resource list sheet. yes we can share it again in slack there's a ton <laughs> louise has amassed she's a magpie for excellent <laughs> resources and so we have uh created a in fact it's still available under the url i'm pretty sure let me go just i probably need to give you a few more and um i'm and I, actually today i realized i need to I need to redo it for a couple of, you know, a different audience. In other words, our content editor audience, we're getting ready to work with them more. And I want to take the most pertinent resources for getting started and put them at the top and then break down into more detail. I'll try to find that and, and post it in Slack. Okay. 